So I'm really interested in what makes a resilient child. So some of the kids that I study come from uh, growing up in, in nope. Okay, we're gonna start again. Okay. Gonna start again. So, it's kind of hard to explain CRISPR though in 10 seconds. Yeah, no, so. no. So I study how the brain uh, recognizes visual objects and actions that we see with the goal of building computer systems that can do the same thing. I make uh, neural implants for the treatment of brain disorders, uh, immune disorders and disability. I study the baby brain and how the functions of the brain develop in the first year of life. I'm a co-inventor of expansion microscopy, which is a technique we developed to allow researchers to physically expand biological tissue. We study odors and how different experiences shape how you feel about those odors. I'm studying the neural mechanisms uh, of attention, selective attention. Broadly, I'm interested in understanding how the brain makes sense of the sensory signals it receives. I trace brain connections to figure out whether abnormal developmental refinement of these brain connections could underlie autism. And so we're discovering and characterizing new immune systems in bacteria that can help us do what CRISPR-Cas9 has done for DNA but for RNA. I and my collaborators are broadly interested in the functional organization of auditory cortex, which is just the part of the brain that's involved in perceiving sounds and understanding speech and understanding music. What I do is develop sensors for MRI to break down that signal into individual neurotransmitter responses. I'm really interested in what makes a resilient child, and I look at it both uh, through behavior and through the brain. I think it was about 5 a.m. or 6 a.m., and we had been staying up all night watching this thing expand because we were being very cautious, we were doing it slowly and watching every step. And we really, at some point in the middle of the night or the early morning, realized that it was working. And um, it was, you know, it was one of those exhausted, ecstatic moments. We went out and got breakfast sandwiches. How exciting! <laughs> breakfast sandwiches! <laughs> <laughs> they were delicious. <laughs> We have, we have kind of found out, figured out how the atom works. We have kind of figured out how you know uh, the the planets actually revolve around each other. So this seems to be like the last major mystery. And I think it's good to say that if there is a concerted effort, 21st century should be the uh, the century of the study of, of how the brain works. Studying poverty from a neuroscience perspective is a really new field. So it's been really illuminating to understand how poverty affects specific parts of the brain more than others. I just got really fascinated by the fact that I had never even thought of this problem of visual recognition and it's yet something that I was doing for you know like 20 years without even realizing it and it just seemed so easy and so I really wanted to understand what the computations underlying it were. Before I became a neuroscientist, I was an artist. My first museum exhibited painting, I made it at age four, and it actually still hangs in my apartment beside a painting I made the summer before I left for college. And that was actually what got me interested in studying vision and specifically color. What ended up happening when I was 12 years old, my mum suffered a stroke. And after that, I've always been interested in restoration of movement neuroscience. This is the place where we, this is the laboratory. This is where I come to live my life. And I, I find it deeply fulfilling. I have a choice. I could do whatever I want to do, and this is what I want to do with my life. Thank you.